Dark Wave. Malessa from Chili Creek has brought alarming news, Commander. Makil is threatening to end Janok's life. Will the Commander find time to help the young cleric? Or will the troubles of a tiny village seem insignificant to one who bears responsibility for the whole world wound? One who possesses powers beyond the imagination of most mortals? Help Janok in Chili Creek. When he was making his way to Chili Creek, the young cleric must have dreamed of converting the whole village to his faith. The reality, however, turned out to be rather different. Now the unlucky preacher needs to be saved from his own flock. Cleric's lying on the riverbank. The sand is soaked with his blood. Save. Save my lesser. Um, <clears throat> why is that Russian? I'm going to deactivate this. Um, make previously answered. Hmm. Unlimited hidden objects. Hmm. I'm not sure which option that was, but this is annoying the heck out of me dialogue ah preview okay let's deactivate preview maybe that will do it what happened to you this village so beautiful so peaceful so many good people living here but something has been worrying me since the day I came here maybe it's the creepy dolls in the trees I couldn't stop thinking about all the strange rituals in the grove and all their weird conversations about firstborns being doomed to die. Oh, let me guess. They offer their firstborns as sacrifices to the demons, so the demons leave them alone. God damn it. I tried not to think too much about it. If the villagers were not willing to embrace the faith of Ella Steel, I didn't want to appear judgmental. But I was wrong. I should have trusted my instincts. There is great evil at work in this village. I'm going to talk normally now. When my lesser and I decided to get married, she told me that she wanted to do it under the rights of Era Steel. I hadn't asked her to do that, but she had already made up her mind. It was entirely her decision. She asked me not to tell Markil about it, and we tried to keep things quiet, but he found out about it anyway. Well, he grew more and more gloomy with every passing day. I did not understand what was going on until Malessa finally told me the truth, something that everyone else in the village knew except for me. Locals perform their wedding rites upstream from the isle on a boat. The bride is supposed to take off her wreath and send it floating down the stream, while she recites a horrible, profane oath that I do not wish to repeat. You see, when she gives away her wreath, she also promises to give her firstborn to the river, body, mind and soul. Body? A body? It may not happen right away. It may take years, but in the end, the river will always take what belongs to it. And Markil, he's a few minutes older than Malessa. Do you see? The dying man whispers hoarsely. You can hear the anguish in his voice. The people of Chile... Whoever... The, the text team, the people that wrote this game, they really like this particular word. The people of Tilly Creek believe that the worship, they worship the river, but these rites are not druidic in nature. They are not rituals of the green faith or the cultic practice of some minor deity. No, this malevolent force, whatever it is, has a physical, has a physical presence in the world. Markil has lost his mind. His parents swore to give him to his monster, and now it has deprived him of his sanity. He took Malessa to the isle. That's probably where the monster lives and where sacrifices to it are made. This village lies on the borders of the world wound. It is not protected by wardstones. The villagers were so proud that their river protected them from demons, but it seems that this protection was nothing more than one monster's attempt to keep other monsters away from its hunting ground. So, um, the locals sacrifice their firstborns to the river, and the bridal wreath is part of the ritual? Not exactly. 
locals are decent people. They don't kill their children with their own hands. The wreath is a sign of obedience. The future parents agree that the river can take their firstborns whenever it wants. It has the right to take their bodies, all their minds. It can summon them at any time and demand services from them. And sometimes the river exercises that right. There is more. Makil was the firstborn son, the older twin. When he did this to me, he wasn't himself anymore. I believe that the river took control of him. Whatever monsters the locals worship has been controlling his thoughts and actions. I'm pretty sure, I mean, it's either a succubus um, or one of these odd ghostly monsters, the one that we already found in another village that we later killed in the ivory labyrinth, you know what I mean. Mm, what must I do to save Malessa? Marquil took her to Pikefin. It's an isle in the middle of the river. You can see it from here. Indeed, if you look closely, you can see small rocky isles, partially obscured by the river mist. Something drove him insane, the evil that has controlled this village for all these years. It lives on the isle. Take one of the boats from the village and set her free. You need help. No, it is too late for me. That's bullshit. We are an angel. We can resurrect the dead. Are you serious? Uh, that's a bit... I mean, it's... I don't really like this. I mean, we have the power to resurrect the dead. But every time someone is supposed to die, we can't do anything? I mean, come on, game. That's a bit immersion breaking. You should allow me to save whoever I want. No, it, I mean, it, maybe make it dependent on an item. Okay, we need a scroll of resurrection. Okay, I'm just going to cheat myself 500. <laughs> no, it is too late for me. I can already hear El Steel's hunting horn. My god is waiting for me. All I ask is that you save my wife. My journey through this world. The cleric can barely speak. He coughs up blood and continues weakly. My journey is over. You've been gravely injured. Who did this to you? Marquil, he wounded me and threw me into the river. I guess he thought I drowned, but somehow I made it back to the shore. Perhaps it was the old dead eye himself who helped me so that I could speak to you. Or maybe because he wants you to live. Oh, darn it. The cleric is having difficulty breathing. Morgrain just heals him and happy ending. Can we continue? Machil, but it isn't his fault. He hasn't been himself. The evil of the river has driven him insane. He must be stopped at all costs, but if you can, if it's at all possible, try to save him too. Rest in peace. What? No! Oh, we can devour him. <laughs> oh, come on. Save her! The cleric's breath is shallow and ragged. The quivering lips go still, his eyes close, and he passes away to his god. Where did the blood come from? <laughs> okay. And uh, not interesting. Mm, so we need a boat. I will defend my dream. What the heck? Water elemental. What kind of demon has giant water elementals? Hmm. Oh, what is more dangerous? The unpredictab unpredictability of nature or the hostile intentions of others? The malevolent force hiding on this isle is as wild, volatile, and ruthless as the natural world, but it also has a cunning intelligence, a devious and vindictive desire to keep away unwanted visitors. As soon as the commander reaches for the oars, the water around the boat turns into a thick sheet of ice. It freezes the vessel in place. What will the commander do now? Summon up an inferno that obliterates half the continent. <coughs> what? Um... <clears throat> Try to break the ice with his weapon. Solid ice is strong, but metal. Wielded by an archangel. <laughs> what? No. Spoiler. Uh, angel is stronger. After a good deal of slashing and hacking, the boat is finally free from its icy shackles. The commander himself, the mighty one, sets off for the shore of the small rocky isle, but his journey does not go unnoticed. And it seems that someone on the isle does not like uninvited guests. Fudley, 
Al Pertine returned. Nobody knows why, nobody knows who he is, but somehow Palpatine returned. Rovagook is furious, another Dark Lord that cannot be accepted. The mist itself rises from the surface of the river, I think, and, uh, wait, of the river, no, no, no. Suddenly the mist that rises from the surface of the river thickens into a dense cloud of fog. It blinds, maybe I should stop the elaborate stories and correctly read there what is in front of me. Without so many mistakes. It blinds the commander and obscures his surroundings. Where is the shore? Where is the isle? The fog is so thick, dude. It can't be any thicker. The commander cannot even see the oar he's holding in his hands. He's completely blinded. What will the commander do now that he is blinded by a fog? <clears throat> Close his eyes. <laughs> Oh, you're blinded. What do you do? <laughs> Close your eyes. That's a genius plan. <clears throat> okay, close his eyes. It is time to navigate by sound rather than by sight. A Jedi approve of this method. <clears throat> Written this text, Yoda did. The sound of running water. The splash of a fish. The wind rustling through the branches of the forest. The sound of a bird chirping on a shore far away. All of these sounds paint a picture in the commander's mind that no fog can hide. A slight breeze slowly begins to dissipate the cloud of fog and tickles on the commander's right arm. <clears throat> the boat is headed straight toward this island. It will not be long before the commander reaches the blacky rocky no the black rocky shore of the pike fin. Continue. The rocky isle is desolate and bare. Blue grey lichen and a few sparse straggling weeds are all that survive on its blacky black rocky shore. Further inland inland the entrance to a cave gapes open like a toothless mouth. The size of a titan. What? Suddenly, a violent gust of wind sweeps out from the entrance of the cave towards the river. The water, which was calm only moments ago, begins to swell into a mass of foaming waves that threaten to smash the boat into the boulders along the coast. How will the commander reach the shore? You know what's relatively interesting about giant waves suddenly appearing? If you watch the Lord of the Rings, you might have noticed there was Arwen. And she went to the river Brenan, and there um, the beautiful river became a, <laughs> a watery spectacle and swept away the Nazgul. Now, in the movie, Arwen said a couple words, but that's, of course, bullshit. She doesn't even exist there. In the books, Frodo is saved by... Wait, not Glorfindel, it was the other one. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. No, 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 no. Uh, it's it's absolutely unacceptable to forget a single name or confuse a single name from Lord of the Rings. Frodo saved by... It's not Glorfinder or was it Glorfinder? Oh, it is Glorfinder. Oh, I'm not stupid, but I did... What well, I wasn't sure, so I'm relatively stupid. Yes, 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 yes. I can... Okay, it says Glorfindel. Perfect. So, in the books, there's this mighty Glorfindel, a mighty warrior, a mighty knight, an elven knight. And he comes on this beautiful horse across um, the companion. I mean, at least Sam, Mary, Pippin, and Frodo, and Aragorn. Which, at that point, they only know a strider. And there comes this magnificent one. And um, he saves Frodo. And he goes to the river Boreen and or well to be precise in the books it's a bit diffi uh, different um the companions arrive at the river Boreen and Frodo alone uh, uh, Glorf um Glorfindel does not ride with a Frodo on the horse and he just bams the horse forward so Frodo can get to Rivendell and he and Aragorn and the hobbits stay behind okay so now you have to picture this there is a river, and there is a before the river and after the river. And after or behind the river, there's Frodo looking back to the river. And the Nazgul appear, the mighty ones. And then, suddenly, the water rises. 
But the Glorfindel doesn't say anything, it just happens. It's an automatic security system, you could say that, um, by Elrond, to protect Rivendell, and Elrond activated it. And the river, uh, of course the river, d it does turn into the picture of, ho of, of horses, like in the movie. Later on it is revealed by Gandalf to Frodo that that was a little trick of Gandalf, because Gandalf wanted the water to look like horses. And then the first Nazguls, three or so, three or four, they go into the river and then suddenly the waves come and they get swept away. And in that particular moment, there are still six, maybe five Nazgul behind them, uh, in front of the river. And then suddenly, out of the bushes, Storm, Aragorn, Glorfindel and the Hobbits, armed with sticks that they lit with fire, and then they drive the Nazgul into the river. Now you might ask yourself, why did they manage to do that? And interestingly enough, in that particular scene when you read the book, you read Frodo's perspective. And at that point, he's already wounded by the Nazgul blade. He is in the shadow, in the dim world between worlds. And he sees a bright white light someone shining so immeasurably bright that it hurts his eyes and that's Glorfindel for that is an elder lord a magnificent one and the whole um, and in the books it's a bit depicted um, a bit differently than in um, Peter Jackson's version in the books the Nazgul cannot see uh, they require the horses to smell and see Yes, they can partially see Frodo at that point because he, his soul, his being, is already half in the in the dim world, in the world between, in the ghost world, because he's wounded. But they require their horses, and their horses see this mighty elven lord and the other odd dudes, the size of a dwarf, with fiery sticks. So they panic and they rush into the river and get swept away as well. I need to admit that seems cooler than the one they depicted in the movie, but of course it would take a while. You also, I mean, it's clear why Peter Jackson did that, because he wanted this romance between Arwen and Aragorn. You see in, in the books, this entire romance story with Aragorn and Arwen, it's very small. It's basically just, they existed, uh, they loved each other, they wed, the end. <laughs> in the movie, it's an entire romance storyline. Um, especially since his entire story arc with Arwen in the movies where she asks her father to reforge the, so um, the shards of Narsil, it's bullshit. In the books, the sword is reforged before the Fellowship sets out of Rivendell. So when the quest begins, when the Fellowship leaves Rivendell to march to, the Mount, to Mount Doom, Aragorn already has Andriel, the Flame of the West. This entire storyline where Arwen returns to her father, You saw a child! The future! You must reforge the sword of the king! Bullshit. Um, sorry for the spoilers in Lord of the Rings, but again, I mean, the books are... How old are they? 50 years now? When was Lord of the Rings? Give me a, give me a tiny second. Le Fellowship of the Ring book release date. My phone, uh, 1954. Jesus. Jesus, that's eight, 68 years. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Wait, no. No, I'm stupid. Wait, 46? 66, 68? No, 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 I'm right. It is 68 years. I mean, it's 67 years since it was released on the uh, 29th of July. So roughly 67 years minus one month and 15 days. But anyway, um, enough Lord of the Rings. It's just oh, Lord of the Rings, beautiful. If you, um, especially if you are for, if you are a non-native speaker of English, and you want to test yourself, read the Lord of the Rings in English. And if you're capable of understanding 98% without looking up words in dictionary, um, <laughs> your skills have exceeded, um, let's just say, 
the average one. Hmm. Okay. Violent gusts, the wind sweeps out from the entrance of the cave toward the river. The water, which was calm only moments ago, begins to swell into massive foaming waves that threaten to smash the boat into the boulders along the coast. How will the commander reach the shore? I mean, also, a scene that is depicted in the book, I mean, it's hinted in the books and then later explained. Um, first, I have to protect Pippin. In the books, Pippin did not light a fire at Weathertop. On the contrary, when the fellowships arrive at Weather Weathertop, they find markings of a battle, a fiery battle. Later it is explained that Gandalf was there a couple days earlier and he fought the Nazgul there. It's a bit of a pity that they didn't depict that one in the Lord of the Rings because it would have been very cool. And then um, they are on the top of the weather top and they look out across the horizon and they see creatures crawling, dark creatures. Of course these are the Nazgul. So Aragorn tells them we need a bit of shelter. So they go down and hide behind the weather top on the ground in a uh, in a small in a place a little bit protected from weather but mm, still open and then Aragorn tells the hobbits to light fire so they have because the Nazgul of course knew where they were so they had fire to protect themselves so it's not Pippin and Merry and Sam wanted a good breakfast and they alerted the Nazgul no 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 the Nazgul already knew where they were and Aragorn himself wanted to light the fire to protect themselves with fire. So it was no, no, this stupid, useless, naive Pippin. He doesn't exist in the books at that point. And even later on in Rivendell, when um, Elrond thinks about who I'm going to send with Frodo, he ponders about hmm, maybe I should send a mighty elven lord. And then Pippin comes and says. I'm going with him and Elrond and Gandalf they will be like no and Elrond says maybe Merry but Pippin no I, I'm not comfortable sending young Pippin and then Pippin says to him um you have to let me go otherwise I'm just going to sneak behind them and join them later on so you either have to throw me into a prison, or I'm going with them. Interestingly enough, er mm, Elrond does argue with the fact that he is um, concerned with the fate of the Shire, and he wants to send Pippin back to the Shire to warn them of the darkness that is coming so they can prepare. Something that of course never happens because Pippin never goes there, and apparently Elrond um, <laughs> can't um, spare a spy or an informant, a messenger, to warn the hobbits. Because later on, of course, in the books, Sar Saruman takes over the Shire. If you don't know that, that is something that was not filmed by Peter Jackson. There is an entire chapter in the third, it's the sixth book, never, never forget. Um, there were three movies, yes, but Tolkien wrote six books and he paired two of them. So. They are three Lord of the Rings books, but each Lord of the Rings books is separated into two different parts. And in the last sixth book, there is an entire big chapter dedicated to the hobbits returning. Everything is fine, and then the Shire is aflame, enslaved, under, com in complete, under complete destruction. And then Saruman approaches a story with him. Saruman has taken over the Shire and he, he never died in the books this uh, deleted scene where Wormtongue takes his knife and stabs him in the back of the mighty Orthanc no is it Orthanc what is the name of the tower Ooh, Isengard it is Orthanc hmm and I mean that scene itself looks pretty cool if you watched the extended scenes to Lord of the Rings, um, when Peter Jackson filmed the scene, you might know that the actor that played Saruman, he's pretty famous. He's called Christopher Lee. 
And Christopher Lee is a remarkable person, or he was, he's already dead. And he actually served in the Second World War in a special division, intelligence service. And when Peter Jackson wanted the scene where Wormtongue stabs him, he wanted him to scream. And then Peter, um, this mighty actor turned to Peter and said, no, that is not the noise that a person does when you stab him to death. And that was odd. And Peter was like, um, okay, and what is the noise that someone makes when you stab him to death? And then... It's the noise. Because the breath is driven out of your body. And... <laughs> Everybody in the set is like, what? Why do you know it sounds if someone gets stabbed to death? Um, so apparently, this magnificent actor was part of some clandestine operation in the Second World War, and Peter Jackson and the crew didn't continue to ask. They were just like, okay, well, you mm, surely know how to to make that sound, so please make that sound. And that sound he did make in the extended scene. Something that Christopher Lee was actually a bit furious, or a bit disappointed about, because that was his only scene in the third movie, and they cut him out <laughs> from the theatrical cut. I once saw an interview where he said, I went to the cinema with my family, and I wasn't in it. I wasn't in the movie. And I called Peter and asked him why. <laughs> well, they did put him in the extended scenes, but not in the theatrical cut of the movies and the cinemas. Well, uh, okay. How the commander reached the shore. <clears throat> Steer the boat through the waves and navigate around it. Da, 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 da. Call out to the unseen force that cast this spell and demand to be allowed on the aisle. That works. Commander's intimidating presence seems to frighten the storm into submission. <laughs> the wind grows calm and the waves subside. He steers the boat down the river toward the island and disembarks without any further complications. It is hard to believe that only moments ago this calm, lazy river was a maelstrom of raging waves and rushing currents. The air is still and peaceful. The howling gales and roaring winds have completely subsided. Okay. Oh, we're still not a come on game. The isle looks calm, but calm, but so did the river. Looks can be deceiving. The lichen covered black boulders along the shore do not look like they have been disturbed. It would be easy to assume this isle is uninhabited. There are no bones nor traces of any rituals, but after moving further inland, the commander sees Markil's boat. It has been carefully pulled up onto the shore beyond the reach of the waves. Noises can be heard from within the cave ahead. There's a shrill, angry voice, followed by the sound of a woman's scream. There's something here. Interesting. My skills are absolute. There's something here. What the? Why are there 10,000 traps here, the heck? Interesting. A trivial task. Follow if you dare. There's something here. Ha! A trivial task. That was easy. Interesting. A trivial task. I'm off. Ha! A trivial task. That was easy. I think I did it. What? Uh, uh, the cave is cold and dark. The ground is covered in fog, and an icy current of air flows toward you from the depth of the cave. Water drips from the ceiling, and dim lanterns cast grotesque shadows on the walls. All these years we've been worshipping the three of you? 
all our prayers to the icy river, all our sacrifices, oh God, and our children. It's been you the whole time. Melissa is huddled in a corner. <clears throat> yes, very cornery. A clasping withered wreath of grass and flower to her, so her, to her head. <clears throat> yes, yes. She, okay, I can't expect them to do a million um, animations. This game is already ginormous in, in size. <laughs> she looks like she's been crying. Standing in front of her are three horrifying old hags. No. One is in front of her, one is to her side, and one is behind her. Uh, Mark Hill sits at their feet like a faithful dog. No, he doesn't. That's fake news. And what's so wrong with us, child? Are we not beautiful? <laughs> the old woman's skin is even whiter than her hair, Gandalf approves, and her breath hangs in the air like an icy mist. Her voice is kind, but her gentle words lack sincerity. Beneath her friendly exterior, she's as cold as truthless as ice itself. We do not wish to bring any harm to you or your brother, but unfortunately you have not given us what we are owed. Deliver to the river what is rightfully hers, and both of you can leave in peace. You're always too soft, Lavixia. This hag's voice sounds like the roar of the wind during a storm. Her skin is covered in spidery blue veins, and her eyes flash like lightning. Do what you're told, lass. Hand over the wreath, or we face the consequences. You will not escape us. You can run, but you cannot hide from old Litinda. Litinda? So there's Loreda. She is Lavixia, and I guess that is Litinda. Loreda, Lavixia, my sisters, do you hear me? Do you know that what is destined to happen must happen? This old woman speaks in a whisper. Her blind eyes are as cloudy as the fog on the river, but she turns and points her fingers at you resolutely. Look, look, looky, looky, look who has arrived. <laughs> this is the one whose face was revealed to us in the dark waters. <laughs> He's arrived already? Well, it is a surprise. The old woman clucks approvingly. We dislike uninvited guests, but you are clearly strong, agile, and smart. We appreciate those qualities in a person. Very well, since you are here, you might as well come in. Malessa, are you all right? Commander, era still be praised. Those, those things drove Markil crazy and made him kill my husband. I, I don't understand what they want. Please save us. So, you praise the old stag now, ungrateful child, who has kept you fed and protected you from every danger. Did your mother worship the old hunter? How about your grandmother or her grandmother before her? Did they offer him praise? I think not. The hag shakes her hoary head in disapproval. Markiel, what's wrong with you? Lavixia reaches down to give the man at her feet a pat on the head. He is absolutely fine. He is a good boy, an obedient boy. He respects his elders, he never talks back, and has respect for his mother river. Isn't that so? Markiel's face is contorted in pain. You can see the desperation in his eyes as he struggles. Against the power that has seized control of his mind. Help me! Save my sister! From me! The river will take! The river always takes what belongs to her! Uh, who are you? Who are we? Oh, perhaps we are the waves on the river, or the fish in the deep. Perhaps we are the mist on the water. Are we solid ice or a raging storm? Why do you ask a question when you already know the answer? Why is the dialogue here better than the entirety of the Kenobi episodes that I watched till now? Damn it. Why are all Hollywood and Disney productions so weak in terms of story and story writing? Uh, Lidinda's eyes stare blindly off into the distance. Haven't we already met between the two shores? My sister is wise, but she likes to speak in riddles. Lavixia's icy blue lips curl into an amicable smile. We are the three maidens of the river, generous to those in the water and revered by those in the land. We fill nets with fish, we keep the filth of the abyss away from our people. And we ask for very little in exchange. Ungrateful mortals. 
Lord Ada stomps her feet. We do everything for them, and what do we get in return? Nothing. It's Nottingham. Instead of being thankful for our protection, these ingrates have started praying to some old bowman. Real life hags. And you are actively practicing magic. How fascinating. Listen, there's something I need to ask. Why do you always gather in groups of three? Ninu produces a piece of paper and waits expectantly for an answer. The numbers have their magic, and we have our numbers. Two has a magic of its own. A pair of lovers, a mother and a daughter, a teacher and a student. Four make a crowd. That's too close to five. Bah! No one can really cast spells in groups of five. Three is the most powerful number in the world. Sets of three are everywhere you look. Everything in the world is either solid like ice or liquid like water or fleeting like fog. Every event was or is or will be. Every person is either here or there or nowhere. The most powerful spells are woven when there are three. What a curious explanation, but it contains a number of logical and factual flaws. Did you know that there are more than three states of matter? Take plasma, for example. I managed to isolate it once. I even held it in my hands, although not very long, but... By the way, did you know that you can determine the severity of your burns by... If you know all the answers, then why are you asking us questions? Stop your foolish prattle, it bores us. So, you've been uh, deceiving the villagers. They think that the worship, they <clears throat> the river, they have no clue that they're actually offering sacrifices to three hags. Is this deceit? They pray to the river. Are we not the embodiment of the river? They make sacrifices, do we not accept them? And when they ask for help, do we not help? Well, there is gratitude for your new Pff, mortals. <laughs> We stay awake all night out of concern for their well-being. We fend off demons so they can feel safe. But instead of appreciating our efforts, they call us liars. If it was up to me, I'd make you... <sniffs> the hag shakes her fist. I mean, theoretically speaking, it's, it's, it's difficult. Right now, we drove the demons back. Everything's fine. We don't need her any blame them anymore. But the world is overrun by demons. Every village gets obliterated. Everyone dies. And here... People get to live with a price. I mean, it's a terrible price. It's a cruel price. It's a de evil, dark price. But then again, they can live. In another village without these hacks, they would have all been obliterated. They would have all been dead. Without the Crusaders, there's no protection. Oh, that's a big dilemma. You shouldn't insult us like that. We find your accusations offensive. We are not mortal tricksters pretending to be gods. We are one with the river. The villagers have agreed to pay the price for our help. We offered them a fair bargain. The haglers and Melesser are coldly. The stupid girl decided to cheat us. If anyone here has fallen victim to deception, it is us. What's going on here? I don't know. They did something to Markil. They made him kill Jen, and they ordered him to bring me here. And now, now they want... We don't want much, child. Just your reading wreath. Give it to us, and the two of you can leave in peace. After all, we have protected you from all kinds of calamities. We have provided your village with food. Don't we deserve your respect and gratitude for our gifts? Will you begrudge us the one thing we ask of you? Why do you need it? Melissa wipes away her tears. You've killed my husband. I'm a widow now. Why do you need my wedding wreath? Wreath, Pathfinder, okay. Succeeded in a knowledge check. You'll recall Janok's words when the villagers cast away their wreath. They promised to give their firstborn to the river. Why would the hags want a widow to complete his ritual? There can only be one answer. Malessa doesn't know it yet, but she must be pregnant with her firstborn child. What did you do to Markil? How have you managed to take control of his mind? How does the river control a leaf that falls into its stream? How does the sky control the fog that rolls in off the water? We didn't do anything. We didn't have to. He is a firstborn and that means he belongs to us. In fact, he was promised to us before he was born. We kept him alive because we thought he might prove useful. And we were right. The river is patient. She does not need to hurry. She can take what belongs to her whenever she wants. That's right. He belonged to us before he was even born. He'll do whatever we tell him to do. Loreda shrieks with laughter. 
<clears throat> Malessa, you are with child. If you give them your wreath, you will be giving away your child as well. While the woman places her hands on her belly protectively. She no longer looks afraid. She stares up at the hags in outrage. So that's what it's all about. That is why you dragged me here. You didn't want the wreath. You wanted what it represents. You, you killed the man I loved. And now you want to take my child away from me? Never. I will not let that happen. So that means... Marquil can barely speak. He struggles to finish his sentence, but with each word he utters, he sounds less obedient and more angry. You're the reason I killed my brother-in-law. Thanks to me, Malessa's child will never know their father. And now you want to take this child from their mother? I won't let that happen. I won't allow it. Wait, what's going on? Are you trying to rebel against us, boy? Oh, don't forget, you will belong to us for as long as you live. You cannot get rid of us, no matter how hard you try. We just have to say the word, and you will be under our control. Heel grabs a stone from the cave floor and attacks the hag. You hear a disgusting crunching sound as Makil smashes the rock into the hag's arm. The hag shrieks and lashes... Wait. He didn't grab a stone, he shot her with a bow. That's fake news. Smashes the rock into the hag's arm. The hag shrieks and lashes out at the man, dealing him a powerful blow. It causes him to fall to the floor and she didn't lash out. She took her staff and smacked him with it right in the chest. Hmm. Kill them, sisters! No one leaves this place alive. Wait, what? Okay. I do what I must. What a discovery. Whatever. We have a new item, right? What do we have here? Hag's demise. This close grants barrier plus for inside bonus on saving throws against hexes and necromancy skill spells. What's well, useless? Only against two types of spells? That's not very good. Let's see how it looks. Oh, that could fit Narushali very well. Hmm. Hmm. But we have only chosen the blue color, right? Even though this color would fit her very well, but no, we're going for blue. Maybe we could give it to Regil. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Uh, where are the two? Can we talk? Huh? What are they? Guys? What the heck? Um. Okay. I guess left the cave without a word. Not even a thanks or. Okay. Thank you for saving us from those monsters. I didn't think I was that was an odd sound. I didn't think I was going to survive in Marquis. I thought I'd lost him forever. Sister, forgive me. I have no excuse for my actions. It is not your fault. I, I guess those hags were controlling your mind, weren't they? They would never have ensnared me if I had not been such an easy target. I really did not like Janok. I was against your marriage, and the hags used that to control me. Melissa looks down. After a while, she answers softly. I don't know if I will ever be able to really forgive you, but you are the only family I have now. I damn. Uh, I should have ended the episode. Already 45 minutes in, and... Now it continues, so I'm going to end this now, we're going to finish this later.